Right, thank you, Ash. So, um, as Ash said, I'm Carty Price. I head up digital media and publishing at the V&A in London. Mm -hmm. My team looks after our digital presence online and digital experience in our buildings. Uh, their team, the team skills cover software engineering, digital design, product management, agile, user mm -hmm. research, analytics, content commissioning, and production. And I'm lucky, the V&A is lucky to have a digital team with such broad and deep skills but that is not the norm in our sector, far from it. And I, I'm conscious I'm speaking from a position of relative privilege here in the cultural sector. So today I'm gonna to unpack a little bit about what we mean by digital skills, what research is telling us about the digital skills we have, the skills and digital literacy we lack. And I look forward to discussing how we might pave a way forward, particularly during this tumultuous time for the sector. So my talk is structured around six provocations. So my first provocation is this, digital literacy matters more than digital skills. I would argue that your executive board or whoever the most senior people in your organisation are, they don't need to know the ins and outs of setting up event tracking in Google Analytics or know how to wrangle JIRA tickets. Those are skills they might not need in their roles, but they do need to work their way around the technical architecture diagram and they do need to understand what digital channels you're using to what end. And that requires a decent level of digital literacy. So what's the difference between digital literacy and digital skills? Think of digital literacy as the why, who and when, and the digital skills as the what and the how. A digital team or person responsible for digital activity will need a bit of both. Nesta's latest digital culture report released at the beginning of 2020 revealed some depressing news. The proportion of all organisations that agree their senior management are knowledgeable about digital technology has fallen from a rather dismal 22% in 2013 to a completely depressing 13% in 2019. Thing is, there is a skills gap, but there's a digital literacy gap too. And unless the senior most leaders in our sector start getting a bit more digitally literate, we risk all the investments and all the hard work we've made in the last decade, particularly the last year or so, coming to nothing. We need more digitally literate leaders who understand the need to invest in digital skills across their organisations. For example, I'd like to see some sort of literacy exchange across the sector where the most senior people get to spend time with some of the amazing talent that exists at the, digital se at the cultural sector's digital cold phase. Last year, there was a massive sector-wide investment from the National Lottery Heritage Fund they funded programmes like Leading the Sector, which was a professional development programme that targeted leaders of medium to large heritage organisations to improve their digital literacy. I look forward to seeing the results of that investment and the impact it's had, but isn't it typical that the one time our sector sees a skills investment of this sort of size, a global pandemic strikes? Provocation number two, the digital skills we most value are also the ones we most lack. So back in 2018, Daph James, my counterpart at National Museum Wales, and I started some research into digital skills across the glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. That research saw a survey around 60 organisations across the globe to find out how they structure and resource digital activity. And it revealed a number of challenges, many of which are linked to digital skills and more specifically a lack of them. We asked our respondents which digital skills they believe to be most valuable. They were technical leadership, content management and editorial, and data management and analysis. We also asked which of a range of digital skills were underrepresented on teams. Those that came out top were data management and analysis, web app development, and technical leadership. So why are the skills that we value the most, namely technical leadership and data analysis, the same skills that are most lacking on digital teams? Well, part of the answer lies in the fact that we don't necessarily need to have all the digital skills in-house. Many cultural organisations, particularly smaller ones, will outsource web development. Those with web development skills in-house believe that's a more efficient way of operating, as long as you've got sustained digital budgets to continue to afford that in-house team. So the question of what digital skills we buy in and what digital skills we need in-house is often determined by the size and resources of the organisation. But worryingly, the majority of our respondents of whatever size of organisation, 72% in fact, 
don't believe that their budgets are large enough relative to their organization's ambition. The other part to the answer, um, sorry, the other part of the answer to the apparent contradiction of digital skills we value versus those we most lack is down to remuneration. The overwhelming majority of our respondents said they're not paid enough. Given that digital skills like technical leadership, web and app development and data analysis are in high demand across all sectors, not just ours, it's no surprise that the relatively poor pay within the cultural sector is not really tempting these people in. So if it's hard to get new digitally skilled staff into our institutions, what about upskilling existing staff? Unfortunately, it's precisely the skills that are most in demand that are hardest to upskill in existing staff, much as I love the thought of curators turned coders, and I'm sure there are some. I also worry that digital skills programmes risk being a band-aid to deeper, more systemic issues within our sector, pay and power gaps around gender, class and ethnicity, and concerns around the cultural sector's dependency on unpaid labour. But of course, this is not an either or. We need to be doing both, investing in our people and tackling some of the more systemic issues that are holding our institutions back. So on to my third thought. The digital skills problems are very different depending on where you look. In other words, there are different flavours of skills problems across the sector. Sure, there are cross-cutting skills that most organisations need, things like content production skills and analytics skills. But it's really hard to tackle digital skills at anything more than at an individual level, a personal level. It becomes all the more daunting at a sector-wide level, as the National Lottery Heritage Fund attempted to do. This is because the implications of skills investment are very different depending on what level and scale you're talking about and the type of organization concerned. What do I mean by that? Well, at an individual level, it depends entirely on the responsibilities of your role and how broad or specialist it is. At group level, it varies hugely. The digital skills needed by, say, a collections management team, for example, in 3D modeling, is very different to the skills a marketing team needs to manage in its digital channel mix. But the problem for the sector, and one of the very best things about it, is its sheer variety. A small theatre company will have very different digital skills needs and objectives to a large heritage building, say. So how can any one skills programme seek to address such a variety of challenges and at such different levels of scale? The findings of One by One, a national digital literacy project um, led by the University of Leicester in partnership with Culture24 might show how. It argued that museum people, indeed cultural sector people, need four things. They need clear and consistent and widely recognised terms and definitions around digital skills and literacies, not a single set list, a checklist. They need responses and support that's strategic as well as practical to really help them tackle some and set some priorities. And they need help in recognising then creating the conditions needed for organisational change to happen. And last of all, they need guidance, tools and resources to support them in building their digital skills and literacy effectively. But in the most recent iteration of One by One, which Carolyn, our next speaker, and I have been lucky enough to be part of, the research has revealed the massive amount of emotional labour involved in the digital role, in any digital role, particularly over the last year. That has basically thrown a whole new lens on skills issues. We're not recognising the huge pressure digital teams and individuals are under right now. We need to recognise the emotional labour inherent in any digital role or activity. Provocation number four. Most of us don't have a clue why we're investing in digital skills. So digital skills are often spoken about in the abstract um, as inherently a good thing, but instead, shouldn't we understand them as a means to an end? And if so, to what end? What are they supposed to help us to do? At an individual level, digital skills can support an individual's growth and delivery within their role. But at a group or organisational level, we need to think of improved skills as a way to help service our missions. My research with DAF revealed that the most, of, most of the organisations we surveyed hadn't actually got a vision for digital success. And where they do exist, these visions aren't necessarily well communicated or understood by the whole team or indeed aligned with the mission of the organisation. So without a clear definition of your digital vision and organisational alignment, how would you know what your digital skills investment should look like? 
The sector has already been busy with lots of different skills initiatives over the years. Um, on Twitter, actually, last year, I asked the sector to share some examples of digital skills initiatives they've come across. And I can't say the response was exactly overwhelming, but the projects that stood out for me are the Merle and Reading Museum's Reading Town and Country Skills and Engagement Programme, the British Library's Digital Scholarship Staff Training Programme, and the skill sharing elements involved in the development of the Welcome Collections editorial strategy. But I have found it harder to find examples of the impact digital skills investments have had beyond uh, at a personal level. So can it be that very few are actually measuring the impact that investing in digital skills have had? The challenge will be that as a sector, we don't appear to be very good at measuring impact. And if we're not good at measuring the impact of our work, why would we be good at measuring the impact of our skills investments, even if we're making them? In the second phase of our research, Daff and I found that 42% of the 100 plus organisations that we surveyed aren't bothering to measure the digital impact of their work. And the reasons is mainly down to a lack of time and a lack of skills. But we really, really struggled with the idea that there's a lack of time. Surely we need to just prioritise the effort needed to plan and measure the impact of our work. Nesta's digital culture report also revealed that a lack of staff, staff time was one of the most frequently cited barriers to organisations realising their digital aspirations, around 60, 68%. So to be successful, any digital skills investment or programme needs to address this really entrenched view that there's a lack of time available to innovate or to measure the impact of our work. But there's another thing, attribution is really hard is not just a lack of time that means we struggle to understand the impact of skills investments. It's really hard to make the link between this sort of investment and any end result. Could we say, for example, the Merle would not have had viral social media success without skills investments? There was undoubtedly a skills, uh, skills element briefly mentioned in the Look at this Absolute Unit report that the then Digital manager Adam Kazarian team, they're hugely, hugely talented, but it's hard to know what portion of this viral success is directly attributable to the skills investment that they made. As the one by one programme pointed out, we shouldn't have a single set list of digital skills and literacies, but where on earth do we begin? Often hard digital skills are the easiest place to start, things like data analysis or product management, and even that's a daunting prospect. Yet these hard skills are constantly evolving. So it's hard to keep up, which makes the prospect even more daunting. I'd say the best digital people are the ones with excellent soft skills too. In fact, I would say that it's the soft skills that matter most. Dr. Lauren Vargas, a researcher in digital strategy, she's been doing some really interesting thinking in this area and believes that emotional intelligence is a fundamental part of the mix. I agree, hard skills will only get you so far unless you've got a good degree of self-awareness and self-knowledge as well as strong relationship management skills and good empathy skills to steer and accelerate your digital activity, you're not gonna get far. So to that end, Lauren is actually working on a periodic table of digital elements, including both the hard and the soft skills needed to make digital happen. And I can't wait to see it later this year. Good EQ is something that's fundamental to what Paul Bowers formerly Director of Exhibitions and Collections at ACME in Australia, describes as the cultural brokership involved in cross-silo thinking. Paul brilliantly summarises, how can we enhance these skills and behaviours in our sector? First, I think we have to stop pretending that organisational change, authority deployment or processes can fix the silos. It's been years, it's failed. It's across all industries and all sectors. Let's focus on reality. And that's why any investment in improving digital skills for our sector is so important and offers an opportunity we simply can't afford to fail at. I really hope that a thorough and better understanding of some of the problems around digital skills might help us avoid some of the pitfalls of past attempts. And I hope that these provocations might go some way to helping us understand some of the complexities inherent within the digital skills agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Carty.